Admiral Li Ximing. You served as Taiwan's highest military commander, the chief of the general staff, from 2017 to 2019, uh, and this capped off a 40-year military career. Currently, you are a non-resident senior fellow at the Project 2049 in Washington, D.C. And last year, you published your book, The Overall Defense Concept, An Asymmetric Approach to Taiwan's Defense. Welcome to Taiwan Talks. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Yeah. Um, Taiwan Vice President William Lai has returned from Paraguay on his first official visit. He transited through the U.S. Some have feared that China might take severe military action. Some analysts are saying even an extreme action like taking an outlying Taiwanese island. What's your view on that? Well, I don't think the uh, China will take severe military action in protesting the winning lies the transits in the United States because it is not the first time our vice president's transit in the United States. They have no reason to do that. For the, uh, any kind of overreaction doesn't make any good for the China itself. Even for the uh, president's highest transit, they only took the kind of a military operation. They didn't take any action on outlying islands. I believe only one purpose that they have the reason to take over outlying island is to make the Taiwan capitulate. But if the Taiwan doesn't capitulate, then the, it would become valueless for them to do so. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a big risk for them to make this kind of uh, decision. Mm -hmm. So you say it's a big risk. What do you expect the international community would do? Probably uh, it's ruin its international image. Probably it will incur for the international sanction and also give the uh, excuse for the United States to develop a kind of anti-hegemonic coalition. You said previously it's not a matter of if China invades, but when. And you've also spoken about the three uh, factors that Xi Jinping is looking at. Number one, uh, CCP internal factors. Number two, uh, the US capability to deter China. And number three, the military imbalance between Taiwan and China. So right now, how do you think Xi Jinping is assessing those three factors? I think the uh, Xi Jinping's personal power within CCP is very uh, stable. You can see that the sudden change the, uh, the position of the uh, Minister of the Foreign Affairs and the commander of the rocket force. It's pretty much in line with the Xi Jinping's leadership's characteristics. So I believe the uh, Xi Jinping's personal power is quite s stable uh, so far. The stable uh, the power for Xi Jinping means the stable the uh, situation across the streets. So you believe that if uh, the his control of the CCP is strong, he's less likely to want to take Taiwan. If his power, personal power, is very stable, I don't think that he would take kind of a dramatic reaction because he doesn't have to take this kind of risk fit for the near term. But in the longer term, if he faced the challenge for his power, he might create this kind of a chaos with the Taiwan and tell the public, we need a strong leader to continuously to achieve our great rejuvenation. Mm. That, that is the, my argument. Mm. Okay. And how about um, the current U.S. ability to deter, deterrence capability? In my opinion, the uh, United States deterrent is, is uh, still there, but um, it is the, uh, weakening. But however, I know the uh, United States is making every endeavor to strengthen its the, uh, deterrence capability. So, so with time, do you expect that to strengthen or, or to weaken? Uh, well, because the deterrence is kind of a relative return and not absolutely the, 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 the concepts. Yeah, because we have to take into consideration China's own 
capability. If China fail to develop in the future for its, its economy or military, then the uh, deterrence of the United States become higher. But if the China grows very rapidly, then the deterrence of the United States will be lower. That is kind of relative things. Mm -hmm. However, United States is also trying to do anything it can to contain China technologically, economically, militarily, diplomatically, everything. So it depends on the uh, kind of uh, balance between the, these two superpowers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how about the military balance or imbalance cross strait? In my opinion, so far, the PLA is not able to take full-scale invention at this moment because they are facing several challenges right now. The first is their amphibious lift is not more enough to send in to send the uh, troops across the strait. Mm -hmm. That is the first challenge. How many troops would do you consider would be needed? Yeah, maybe uh, more than hundred thousand. The otherwise they are not able, you know, to uh, physically uh, occupy the Taiwan Islands. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, because Taiwan is a highly urbanized uh, country, mm -hmm. so there's uh, no many uh, good beach for landing operations. And third, the PLA is the still lacking of the joint operation experience, the, such as organizations, doctrine, joint plan, joint training, common operating picture, joint coordination, and etc. And finally, if even the PLA is able to successfully land it on our territory, it still face the uh, follow-on logistic support if Taiwan still continues to resist on the, the uh, land battle. Yeah. Mm. So Taiwan has completed um, its largest annual military drills, the Hanguang exercises, and critics say that it's focused disproportionately on amphibious landings of the PLA. Uh, What's your assessment of the scenarios that should be the priority for Taiwan's defense? So this is the uh, military focus on the uh, beach defense and uh, urban warfare. I think that it's the good exercise event because the, we didn't pay much attention for the uh, urban warfare and the beach defense in the past. So this year, military choose to focus on beach defense and, and uh, urban warfare. I think that is a good decision. Well before Chinese boots on the ground are on the ground in Taiwan, um, the experts say that the first assault, um, if, if there was this possible Taiwan contingency, um, would be uh, cyber, massive cyber and missile attacks. So how is Taiwan preparing for this? I don't think that kind of a cyber operation, uh, as people say, uh, will have such serious impact, like to make you the collapse of your infrastructure, make your financial system down. I don't think they can really do that. Well, why do you say that? Have you ever experienced or heard about the uh, kind of a cyber attack to cause the infrastructure totally down? Let's, let's see the uh, Ukraine war as an example. Russia's cyber force is quite famous. Mm. But did they? Uh, they didn't use it. Yeah, they did use it. But, but, the, but the problem is, you know, the cyber operation the, uh, sometimes the, has to be over exaggerated for its effect. Mm -hmm. I, in my in my point, the, the cyber operation is more intelligence than the destruction of the so-called infrastructure or other make your system totally down. Mm -hmm. So so don't worry too much about it. However, we have to do something to well prepare our cyber. Defense, well, but for you... also the missile missile attacks.
But you can see that Russia launched the over 2,000 long-range missile. What results he got? So don't worry too much about that kind of attack. As long as you can establish kind of a mobile distributed, highly survivable forces, then the, uh, the, I don't think there would be the kind of a severe, severe pro serious problem for us. Mm. I mean, in the US, there was the colonial pipeline, which was hit by the Russians, a cyber attack. Yeah, um, yeah. so and, and that caused... is just a few days in fact. It, so not serious as the people think, you know, mm. yeah. And so perhaps Taiwan's defenses will be able to to, uh, to manage. Um, but all Taiwan's cyber defense, I think, to... is also, also good compared to the other military preparation. Mm. I'm confident for the uh, cyber defense for the uh, Taiwan itself. Taiwan has a lot of experience. I mean, we have millions uh, of cyber attacks every day. So we've established that you believe our defenses are quite strong against any possible cyber or missile attacks. But in terms of the advancing troops, from the PLA uh, before they actually reach uh, Taiwan's shores. How is Taiwan preparing to stop that advance? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, when I was the, in the office the, uh, during the uh, time of 2017 to 2019, I developed and uh, promoted the uh, overall defense concept. One of the asymmetrical capabilities that I want to establish is a kind of the uh, anti ship attack capability that will increase the uh, land-based mobile uh, missile trucks or the micro, fast micro uh, missile boats for all kinds, that kind of anti-ships, the missile attack capability, that would be the most effective things that we can counter the enemy across the streets. But also some, some attack UAV or sea mine deployed in front of the Red Beach is also effective ways. I believe we should concentrate on this part. If we can really can develop this kind of robust defensive measure, I don't think that the PLS is able to cross the straits to land our territory. So far, Taiwan is facing two kinds of threats. The first is the kind of coercive threats. The, uh, for example, they are doing the, uh, the, uh, the gray zone aggression every day, uh, sending the uh, military aircraft, uh, naval ships, sailing, flying around our, our area. Mm -hmm. That is kind of a coercive threat because they use the, the military operation but still under the war threshold. The purpose of the, this kind of coercive gray zone operation is trying to send in the strong signal to the Taiwan, to the United States, even to the Japan. They have the red line. But also they can test our response. But also they can wear down our conventional platform capabilities. Because the, uh, encountering the, uh, this kind of coercive threats, we usually use the conventional platform to counter this kind of gray zone. Aggression. So what kind of weapons do we use then to counter? Yeah, like naval ships, mm. fighter jets. Mm. But for this kind of one-on-one -on -one countering the major, I don't think it is good because they, they have more the assets than we have. What would your um, recommendation be? So not to scramble the jet fighters every time. I believe we urge in to the need that kind of a long endurance UAV so that we can use this kind of UAV instead of the manned aircraft to counter this kind of gray zone aggression. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, gray zone aggression is make you scared, make you capitulate. So you have to think sobriety. As long as you don't surrender, you don't capitulate, then that is not so meaningful for the gray zone operation. So when we hear analysts talking about, you know, the use of grey zone or coercive ta tactics, short of war, as you mentioned, 
the only way this could actually succeed in actually taking Taiwan without a fight, which is what they, uh, they write about, is if we actually capitulate. Yes, but I don't think they can really make it. A lot of the people in Taiwan, they don't buy it. They don't capitulate it. People have talked about Ukraine's ability to combat Russia with asymmetric weapons, um, you know, and with being even being a, a much smaller uh, force compared to the Russians. Can you talk about um, some of those weapon systems that Ukraine has, has repeatedly asked for, long-range precision missiles and, and fighter jets? Because these are the things that Taiwan has been criticized um, for, for having or wanting to acquire. And obviously with the missiles now, Taiwan is making it themselves. So now everybody has seen that the uh, Ukraine use uh, asymmetrical capability, like the uh, Javelin missile or Stinger missile, successfully defend the uh, invasion from the Russia. But don't forget, they use this kind of asymmetrical weapon system to defend themselves. But for those kind of small arms, asymmetrical capability, high, highly survivable capability, is not enough to strike back. So they ask more fighter jets, tanks, the long range the missiles, mm. because they want to strike back. Mm. But for the same situation applied to the all Taiwan's contingency, mm. don't forget, mm. we want to defend ourselves. Mm. We don't want to attack the mainland China. We have to have the opportunity cost, the concept of, of, of opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. You spend money here, you don't have the money spent there, mm -hmm. especially for the constraints of our defense budgets. We have to spend our money smartly. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that our indigenous missiles, long-range missiles, you believe that that's money not well spent? Well, this depends. All long-range missile can only be used for the tactical purpose. It's an, it cannot decide the outcome of the, uh, the battlefield, and it also must be able to deter China from taking the invention. No way, because we don't have too much money. Even we can successfully produce this kind of long-distance missiles, well, the number is still not enough. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, the long-range missile is only one element for this kind of long-range attack. Because if you want to attack the uh, targets thousand kilometers away, you need to have the capability to de detect, trace, lock, hit the target. And finally, you need to make assessments to see if I already hit it or I have to attack again. For those kind of long-range kill chance capability, we don't have any kind of technology to accomplish that. I want to say it again, yeah, you know, for the overall defense concept, it's concentrated not only the military, military problem, but also economic problem. We don't have enough money compared to them. So we, that's why I say we have to spend money in a smart way, you know. Mm -hmm. You want to fight everywhere, you will lose everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. In terms of the grey zone warfare and the coercion, our Minister of National Defence, Chou Guozheng, has said that um, any entry of Chinese aircraft into Taiwan's airspace will be treated as a first strike. Do you believe that the, uh, this message has got through very clearly to the PLA, given that we do have no formal lines of communication? He announced that the uh publicly. The, I believe the uh, China already hear that. From the theory of the deterrence, the, there are three elements very important. First is capabilities. Mm -hmm. Second is the credibility. Mm -hmm. Third is the communication. Mm, right. Capability you, you need to build up by yourself. Mm -hmm. Credibility is the way that you have to make the, uh, your enemy believe that you have such kind of a capability. If you want to invade me, you will suffer a huge loss. Mm -hmm. The most difficult part is the communication, especially we have no direct dialogue 
across the street. So we send signal indirectly. That is why I say when we establish our self-defense capability, we also need to have a dialogue with them, just like the United States is doing so. He is doing everything to contain China, but he continues to ask to meet, to have hotline with the, uh, with the China. It's, it's a similar situation. Talking about the US being Taiwan's uh, security provider, uh, you have talked about the need for coordination with the US over the defense, overall defense uh, concept. And you've talked about setting up a working group between Taiwan and the US. Has there been any progress on this? They are making some progress there. You know, I propose to join the working group consisting of the decision, decision level and the working level. But according to the media reports, now the United States already established kind of a joint training team in Taiwan. It's a kind of a work for the working level. But I know the decision level, decision making level, they're already there. So uh, considering the, the, for the joint coordination, that is some, something we have to do. Don't forget, the, you know, U.S. and Taiwan, we don't have the uh, joint command and control and the communication mechanism, and we don't have the real-time intelligence to sharing mechanism, and we don't have a common operating picture and interoperability, even we don't have the faster side prevention mechanism. So it's hard to make anyone believe that the United States and the Taiwan can work together, fight against China. We will get a problem. That's why the ODC proposed that Taiwan should concentrate on the short and the medium range battlefield and leave the space for the long range battlefield for the United States and, and, and Japan. Otherwise, we got a problem for the joint coordination, mm. for the joint working group. But is this an instance where, you know, we, Taiwan, must rely on its own defenses because it cannot rely on the United States and its allies? Yes. God only help those who help themselves. I tell you something. If we can be well prepared, there's more possibility that the United States will intervene. The best sense situation, the best situation that serves the United States interest is that the Taiwan can establish very strong self-defense capabilities. Once the China decided to invade us, the United States will suddenly intervene whatever they use, inter international sanction, economic sanction, or attack the China from the long distance. Because you can defend yourself, and you, your existence is my interest. So lost of the uh, Taiwan will definitely hurt the interest of the United States, because they, if the uh, Taiwan being attacked and the United States just uh, stay uh, aside, the, it will lose the credibility in this region. And the United States is no more leading country in the world. I don't mean the uh, United States will definitely intervene mm -hmm. in case of a war, because the United States is still applying the kind of a strategic ambiguity. Mm -hmm. But if we have a very strong self-defense capability, there's more possibility that the United States will intervene to help us. That's my argument. And a strong capability for defense also includes, in your book, uh, civil defense. And so you talk about a civil, setting up a civil homeland defense force, rather like what they have in Israel. There are some sort of private groups that are exploring this slowly. Um, do you have a role yourself in helping Taiwan to set this up? I think civil defense there will demonstrate the, uh, your will to resist, to defend, to fight. 
it is a kind of very important fact for the deterrence. For the civil defense, I don't mean that. So I want civilians to, to, to sacrifice their life to fight against the regular troops. It doesn't make sense. But however, when you have a very strong civil defense, when they successfully landed our territory, they have to face the difference, the, uh, the, the force. So one is a regular force, is one is kind of an urbanized the warfare, guerrilla operation from the civil defense. The problem is still, so far, you know, all the private organizations, they promote the uh, civil defense. They have no right to possess the R because Taiwan's law doesn't allow them to possess R. So that's the, uh, there will be no credibility for our civil defense. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the government should take lead on this. Now, we rely on our reserve system. We control two million people, but probably the portion of the two million people, they don't want to fight. You mobilize them, they don't want to fight. Then you will have no credibility for the enemy. Then you don't have the deterrence effect. But if you can recruit the volunteer to develop kind of territorial defense force still under the military control, then you can show your will to fight because you want to do that, because you love your country, you want to defend the country, so you join territorial defense forces. So that's how our deterrence can occur. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Admiral Lee. Thank you very much for joining Taiwan Talks today.